Um, um, I, I'm just curious uh, from the folks I can see, for a show of hands, um, how many of you know our store? Okay, some, some do, some don't. <laughs> Um, so what I was going to do is, so I'm Jeff Mayerson, and I'm the co-owner of Harvard Bookstore, along with my wife, Linda Siemenson. And <clears throat> I wanted to give you guys a sense of where we see the industry is right now, particularly from the viewpoint of an, of a, of an independent bookstore. Um, and there are some, I mean, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be news to anybody that there are some unique challenges that we're facing right now. And that's probably one of the understatements of the, uh, of, of, of the year. Um, so um, <clears throat> what I wanna do is, I'll, I'll, some of this is stuff that I covered at last year's conference. Um, and um, so, but I'm gonna run fairly quickly through it uh, in terms of the introduction to our store. And then I'm gonna move into the challenges that we've had during the pandemic, my view about what the future holds, and then how we can work together with small and independent presses. So, um, um, <clears throat> so our store was founded in 1932 at the, uh, during the Great Depression. My wife and I bought it from the son of the founder of the store, um, you might say at the beginning of the Great Recession. So I don't know if there's any meaning to be read into those two facts, except for the fact that maybe booksellers are not very good in, in terms of their timing. Um, we, um, we occupy 5,500 uh, 5, square feet of retail space on Mass Ave across from Harvard Yard. We sell new books, used books, remainders, and non-book items at roughly the ratio 70, 10, 10, and 10. So we're really focused on new books. We do consider ourselves to be an academic bookstore, but we made the brilliant decision long before we bought the store not to sell course books. Course books have lousy margins, and at the end of the day, both the students and the professors end up hating you. So we avoided that market. Um, we deliberately limit the number of non-book items that we sell. I personally bought a bookstore because I was interested in books. I wasn't in love with retail. And we have a warehouse in Somerville where we process our remainders that we've opened up recently twice a year for our for a warehouse sale. So here's a picture of the store. We actually occupy, this is the main entrance to the store. We occupy three storefronts on Massachusetts Avenue, as I said, right across from Harvard Yard. Uh, this is a somewhat dated picture, but it gives a, a sense of what the store is like. Our brand really is academic books. We're a general purpose bookstore with a focus on academic books. And so you can see in this central aisle in the store, academic new arrivals, Oxford short introductions, cultural and critical theory, women's queer and gender studies, Western philosophy. So it gives you a sense of the sorts of books that we carry. And we carry, of course, literary fiction, genre fiction, et cetera. But we're known, what differentiates us from, differentiates us from a typical neighborhood bookstore is the attention we pay to academic books. And here's a view of our warehouse. Um, I guarantee you that it is almost never looks this neat. Um, the, this, as I mentioned before, we open up the warehouse twice a year for, for the customers so they can get bargain books. And so this was probably taken just before a sale when we were, were at our absolute very best. Um, my own background, I was originally a particle physicist. I studied at Harvard and Yale. And then I went off and worked on the internet for 20 years, starting in 1978 at a company called Bolt, Baranek and Newman, which built the, the, um, the prototype for the original internet. And then I did a, a startup, uh, 10 years I spent at uh, Sonus Networks, and their goal was to build um, technology that would allow telephone calls to be carried on the internet. And a number of the executives at this company went on to different careers. Um, our chief financial officer became a master chef. One of my fellow vice presidents um, became an astronaut and um, um, was the first Iranian woman to travel to the International Space Station. Our VP of sales started a microbrewery in New Hampshire and I bought a bookstore. Okay. 
So the question always gets asked, well, why would a high tech guy go completely analog? Um, and particularly in the year 2008, when the economy was falling apart. Um, I guess if I were a better business person, I probably wouldn't have done it. But um, I, I truly believe that bookstores, I lived in bookstores all my life, essentially. I, I thought that I always felt that bookstores were central to, the, to their communities. And my wife and I wanted to give back to the community. Of course, you only buy a bookstore if you love books. And um, I certainly, I, I, I spent most of my time, even in tech, on airplanes, uh, reading books. Uh, in fact, one of the thing, interesting things I think is that uh, we'd be, uh, it, one of the problems that we have as business people in this industry is we love the product too much. So for example, um, one of the ways you stay afloat is by returning books that funds the purchase of books for the next season. Well, I have a hard time returning books because I love them too much. Um, and then the other reason I bought it was because the technolog technological promise of print on demand. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So first, just before the pandemic, this was the situation at, say, 50,000 feet. Um, after the emergence of the big box stores and Amazon, sales had been in serious decline for a number of years. But in the last five or six years or so, sales had been on the increase. And in fact, our prior fiscal year was the biggest year in the history of the store, not adjusted for inflation, admittedly, but there were a lot of dollars pouring in. And the fiscal year, which ended just around the time the pandemic began, was, a, was um, on a path to become an even, have be an even bigger year. Despite the increase in sales, financial viability for us was always a problem. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Uh, the other thing that was apparent is when I bought the store, there were all these doom and gloom predictions about how digital reading was going to supplant the physical book. And you had all of these techno pundits making that claim. The fact of the matter is it appeared um, after a number of years of rapid growth that in, in effect, I, I have here that ebooks were declining, but the reality is probably more like they plateaued. And they primarily did not affect the majority of the books that we sold, didn't really hit literary fiction or serious nonfiction, um, academic uh, books from academic presses, but it really seemed to affect most significantly genre fiction. Um, another comment on the state of the industry is that many stores rely on non-book items for profit, but we don't. As I said, I'm interested in books. Uh, and this is not a criticism of um, of stores that do uh, rely on, have, have a lar larger uh, inventory of non-book items. You do what you have to do to stay, to stay alive. And so I don't criticize stores that do that. The other observation, of course, is that self-publishing has expanded rapidly. And also, why do people look at, go to bookstores? In part, because they're looking for experiences, whether it's the browsing experience or the author event experience, they're, they're, they're part of a community. And the other obvious observation is that there has been significant consolidation in the industry. The most significant example of that is the creation of Penguin Random House, but also Ingram's emergence as essentially the only game in town as a national distributor and wholesaler. So this is a little bit what I'm talking about. Here is our revenue curve from 2008, the time that Linda and I bought the store to 2020. And you can see at the beginning of the recession, there's something of a decline, and then it goes straight upward, which is the kind of sales chart that a business owner likes to see. Unfortunately, here's the cost curve. And it, you, could, you will all notice that it's doing exactly the same thing. Um, and what's driving the cost increase? Well, you know, we're in Cambridge and we're in Somerville. We, not only do we have our store, but we have our warehouse and we have offices. Somerville is an interesting case. It's undergone an incredible transformation. Our warehouse is in the old Ames Paper Company complex. And when we bought it, it really was a manufacturing facility and a warehouse facility. Now we're the only warehouse left. And what's in that is a maker space and a rock climbing gym and a high-end restaurant and a microbrewery. And so you can see in that kind of situation, the landlords can extract much more rent from us than they could if it was simply a warehouse. 
Uh, as a good progressive, I support the $15 minimum wage, but it does pose an existential threat to a business like my own. And it's not just that the minimum wage raises the wage of the bottom. You can't pay somebody who's been in the store 10 years the same that you pay somebody who's been in the store 10 months. So it has the effect of raising the entire wage scale, which is a good thing. It's just a significant problem for the business. We're all, we're all aware of escalating health insurance costs and the cost of everything else, else is going up. Of course, the problem with the book industry, which is different from most retail, is unlike every other, most other retail that you, you know, that, that you interact with, the price of our product is printed on our book, is, is printed, is, the price of the product is printed on the product. So we have limited ability to raise prices. Uh, we can decrease prices, we can discount, but we can't really raise them. We did an experiment with one of the major publishers of not putting prices on the book, but actually, paradoxically enough, that made the situation worse um, because um, um, if there's no price on the book, then people go to the major distribution channel to figure out what the price should be. So instead of using the list price of the book as their benchmark, they're using Amazon pricing as their benchmark, which is a worse situation than when the price is actually printed on the book. So our strategy in the face of all of these, uh, this landscape was to focus on things that the large uh, internet booksellers couldn't do. Customer service, community engagement, providing experiences for our customers, subscription services, print on demand, social media, corporate sales. And we were even looking for another we're in the, for another site, another location. We have this infrastructure. And so the thinking was we can leverage the infrastructure of, over multiple uh, incarnations of the store. The greatest thing that happened to me, it's hard to talk about great things in a pandemic, was I was on a path to sign a lease just before the pandemic broke. And if I had done that, the results would have been catastrophic. So um, uh, I was very, very lucky in that regard. Here's examples of community engagement. I'm on a number of different boards, Boston Book Festival, 826 Boston, which reaches inner city kids through writing projects, Boston Review, an intellectual journal. And then we have a number of different partnerships, the Simmons Leadership, Simmons uh, Women in Business Leadership Conference, um, the Hoffman Breast Cancer Center at Mount Auburn Hospital. What we're most known for, I think, is, is events, and in perhaps particularly large events. Before the pandemic broke, we were doing between 450 and 500 author talks a year. Um, and many of these were, were very prominent writers or celebrities. You see, this is a list, Ronan Farrow, when his book came out, Jim Comey, Pete Souza, the um, White House, uh, Obama's White House photographer, who's we, we hosted him many times. Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, the actor David Duchovny, Jesmyn Ward. So these, these were large blockbuster events. But in keeping with who we are, we also do smaller events, but events in the store. We have a series called the Friday Forum, which focuses entirely on books from academic presses. And we have a collaboration with Grub Street where we feature um, first time writers. Uh, we call it New Voices in Fiction. So we're always basically trying to pay attention to emerging writers also. Here's a picture of a warehouse sale. Of all the things that we've done since Linda and I bought the store, this was the one that has really gone viral. Um, we held it twice a year in June and December. And at each one of these sales, I would guess by the way that this, just the way that people are dressed, that this is the June sale. And uh, over two weekends in June, we, we estimate we had between seven and 10,000 people buying remainders from us. We also offer subscription services, both for established writers and also that is providing books by established writers and buying books by first time writers um, that we think are really, really promising. We call it new voices in fiction. We, pay a lot of attention to social media. Our, we, have, we issue a newsletter twice a week and it goes out to about between 50 and 70,000 people. We have 65,000 followers on Twitter. We pay a lot of attention to Instagram. And then we have our espresso book machine. And I said, this was one of the reasons I was really interested in going into the book selling business. 
if you're not familiar with the machine, it prints a perfect bound paperback in about five minutes. And what have we printed? Well, we've printed all the books, all the public domain books that Google um, scanned from the, many of the major libraries in the world. Publishers have given some permission for us to publish uh, from their backlist. Um, but the majority of work that we do on the Espresso book machine is serving the self-publishing author community. Com community. So you can have your book published on our machine um, and um, we will sell it in the store. We will list it on the website. Um, and this is not necessarily an exclusive arrangement. You can, you, can, you can make your book available to the public in a lot of different ways, not incompatibly, and one of them is on our book machine. So now I wanna to move to the discussion of what's going on in the pandemic. So I'm gonna start with a, with a timeline so I think we all became aware of the pandemic roughly in the end of February. I've lost track of the time. We may have known something about it earlier in the year, but, but it, it really hit us big time in March. So in mid-March, publishers began to be cancel their author events. Um, and we lost a number of events that I was really looking forward to. Um, you know, Hilary Mantel came out with her third book in the, in the Thomas Cromwell series and we had her scheduled and she very rarely appears in the United States. Um, in mid-March, we were forced to close the store to the public, but we continued to fulfill our own web orders. Uh, the other thing that we did was given that revenues had plummeted and you know, we bring books into the store from publishers, we have to pay for them. Um, but when there isn't offsetting revenue coming in, then we have a really serious problem. So we spent almost the entirety of March and April actually returning books to the publishers. We emptied out the store and got credit against the bills that we owed on those books. Um, in the beginning, almost at the very beginning of the pandemic, we moved to virtual events. Um, um, in late April, we actually had to close the store down even to employees. So we moved to a third party bookseller called bookshop.org where we got a much smaller fee on the books that we that were sold on our bookshop.org web um, page, but at least it kept some money coming in. Uh, the real lifesaver in the pandemic was in June when we got our PPP loan, um, which provided essentially two months of rent and payroll. Um, I wanna make a point, which I'll make again later, is we, throughout this entire period, we did not lay a single employee off and you know, for uh, not, you know, some books were, some stores were forced to do it. We did not. And the PPP loan helped with that. Then as things began opening up at the beginning of June, we started fulfilling, we moved back from bookshop and started fulfilling our own web orders. And then in the beginning of the July, we were able to open the store again. Unfortunately, during normal times, we were open 14 hours a day, every day, except for Sunday when we're open 12 hours. Those are a lot of hours. Um, when we opened the store in July, we were closed one day a week and the hours were really limited, 11, 11 a.m. basically to 6 p.m. And of course, the other issue is that we had to limit the occupants, the number of customers and it, that are, were in the store at any time in order to maintain proper social distancing. So here's the effect of the pandemic on sales. Um, at the left end of this chart, is the before time starting with May of 2019. The big peak in the middle of the chart is December of 2019 when we had Christmas sales. And then you can see as the pandemic happened, it, it, sales essentially went to zero. They've come back now, the store is open, but you can see we're basically, essentially sales are down 50%. So, I don't know how many of you may have owned your own businesses, but a decline of 50% in sales is catastrophic to a business. Um, and uh, we are losing money every, every month. Um, um, by the way, I, I don't want this to be too depressing a talk. There are some positive aspects here, but, uh, uh, but the reality is right now that, uh, that we operate, we're operating in the red. We have a fairly strong um, balance sheet so we have a, you know, many months to survive this, but that's where we are. The one bright spot in this, um, if you can call the, uh, if you can even dare make the statement that a pandemic has a bright spot, 
um, is um, internet sales. From the very, very beginning, um, internet sales really exploded for us. So you can see on the left hand is the before times. And then you, the, as, as the numbers increase, that's when we were when we were offering internet sales in the pandemic. And typic, the typical day has 10 times the number of sales um, that we had prior to the internet sales prior to the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, which is great. Unfortunately, the volume isn't enough to sustain the business. Um, since the pandemic started, we started doing virtual events and we do them every single day. Um, some days we do multiple events. Today's an example where we, where we did two events. Um, we started out on Cradcast, we moved to Zoom. One of the interesting things about virtual events is that the turnout was far greater than physical events which may not be a surprise. I mean, you can just go to your computer and watch the event as opposed to driving into Harvard Square, try to find parking. So, and an example of this, the first event we did was for the Globe columnist, Alan Beam, uh, uh, columnist Alan Beam, who wrote a new book on the architect, uh, Mies van der Rohe. And we had, we had originally scheduled that book to be, that event to be in the store where we would have expected 75 people we had over 600 people attend this virtual event. That's the bright side. The bad side is that book sales at virtual events are pathetic. Um, we, we, we may have 400 people in an event and sell two or three books. And the reason for that is you don't get a chance to interact with the author. You don't get a chance to, in most cases, you don't get a chance to get a signed book. And so a lot of the things which are attractive about book talks don't apply necessarily to virtual events. There are some exceptions to this with a few celebrity authors, we are able to, we are able to make the, uh, the purchase of a book, the price of admission. Examples of this are Margaret Atwood and David Mitchell. We've had some very successful special events just after the George Floyd killing, um, we organized in a, a, a fundraiser basically featuring um, five very prominent African-American um, um, scholars. And we had 1,500 people register for that event. Um, and we raised something like $15,000 for the charities that they chose. Just yesterday, we, decided we had a, um, an election event. Um, and in this case, we wanted to be somewhat different from this, you know, the talking heads you see on MSNBC these days. So we wanted actually writers to um, speak, to give the writer's perspective on what happened. And so you see, we have Stephen Greenblatt, uh, expert on Shakespeare and many other things. Mar um, Martha Minow, the former Dean of Harvard Law School. Tim Snyder, who has written brilliantly recently on tyranny on authoritarian regimes. Um, Mariama White Hammond is perhaps the one non-writer in the, in the group. Um, she is an, a minister and an activist, uh, a climate activist, um, but with a very interesting and dynamic point of view. And it, the, this event was brought together by James Carroll, the novelist. Um, the situation that we're in right now has a number of other complications. Um, um, most particularly, this is, this is an article from the New York Times from a, maybe a month or two ago. And it talks about the fact that there is a serious shortage of printing capacity in the United States. And this is having a serious impact on our business. Um, the manifestations, well, I'll give you some examples of how it's affecting the business. Um, President Obama, of course, the big event of this publishing season is the publication of Barack Obama's memoir, White House memoirs. It's happening, it's launching on November 17th. We asked for a thousand copies of the book. Random House told us they could only give us 400 copies and those copies are being printed in Germany. So they're not even being printed in the United States. But more potentially threatening to, the, to our business is the fact that we've been told that we can, typically what happens in the holiday season is there are a number of books which become surprise bestsellers that we didn't order enough in the beginning of the season. Well, with this printer capacity, capacity issue, we were told by publishers, don't count on us to be able to replenish inventory of, of, um, best, of, of bestsellers later on in the season. 
That is the books that you're going to order, you should be ordering right now. And by right now, that really meant August. So, you know, the, in a situation where money is tight, where cash is tight, you the buying pro, the buying problem becomes much much tougher. How much cash do you all allocate? How much money you're willing to bet on a book? And then what happens if a book becomes big and you didn't anticipate that? So the so the printer issue is really affecting our business and the way in which we operate the business. Another, I didn't expect you to read this paragraph. What this paragraph is, it's from a profile that was done of Madeline McIntosh in the New York Times on September 19th. Madeline, for those of you who don't know who she is, is essentially the head of Penguin Random House. And in that article, she talked a lot about their new strategy of going direct to consumers. Um, now, I personally don't necessarily think they're going to be very good at that. Um, you know, in the article, um, they, they, Random House boasted about they, they have a, lots of details on 100,000 book buyers across the country. Well, we have lots of details on 100,000 book buyers only in the, in, you know, the block around Harvard Square. Um, so, um, you know, I don't, and then the other thing is, will customers really go to a site where they can only buy books from one publisher so that in order to purchase the books, they have to go from publisher to publisher to publisher. Um, but on the other hand, whether or not this is a good idea, they may decide to, um, to go more and more direct to consumers. And I can see that one of the reasons they would like to do this is that the independent bookstores are a very, very expensive channel to service. You know, there are thousands of us, we're all different, we're like herding cats, we all have our own brands, our, they have to supply a, a sales force for this. So it's very expensive for them to maintain, to maintain us as a channel. The reason it's important for them is because we think we, we, um, we provide the world with information about books beyond the number of books that we sell. So they view us as an important marketing force in their ecosystem. But they could decide to do this as simply a dollar and cent sort of um, uh, matter. So here's an overview of where we are in the pandemic right now. I, I made the point, uh, revenue is not commensurate with expenses, and we've worked very hard not to follow our st um, furlough our staff. One of the problems we face right now is that the holiday sales season is what tends to fund retail for most of the year. In our case, we're not as bad as other, um, retail, uh, other retailers in that regard, because we also follow the academic calendar. But even for us, holiday sales represent roughly 20% of annual revenue. One of the interesting trends in consumer behavior is that more and more over the last few years, those years, those sales have concentrated in the few weeks in the run, in the last few weeks in the run up to Christmas. So it's all focused on a few weeks where our store is absolutely packed with people, last minute holiday shoppers. Well, the problem is if you're limited in the number of people that you can actually accommodate in your store, this can't happen. So one of the ways in which we've, we've, we've um, gained sales in the holiday season, that avenue is no longer available to us. Um, the other problem we have is this issue of printing capacity. Can we replenish stock of books that we've run out of? And then, of course, to the extent that we have a web business, of course, as we know, the current administration has threatened to completely dismantle the U.S. postal system. And so there are all kinds of reports of incredible postage delays for books we're mailing to customers. And that basically says, if you ordered the book from us maybe as late as December 5th, we may, we may not be able to get the book to you by December 24th. So like, you know, we could take one of these headaches or two of these headaches, but it's really like a trifecta. Um, uh, and then the, <clears throat> the other thing is that um, uh, we observed in the publishing industry that social distancing is really creating all kinds of coordination problems. Simple things become hard you know, publishes promises book plates with books that we have to mail out on Monday and the book plates don't show up till two Tuesdays later. Um, and then I talked about the question about the buying problem and how do you do it where cash is short, 
where supply supply is problematic, um, and that's that's something our our buyers have to juggle all the time. I want to make the point that we're not alone in this. Um, many, some of you may have read the that um, the, the Paris bookshop Shakespeare and Company announced to the world that they were having very very serious problems in the pandemic. In the last few weeks, you may have seen that the Strand Bookstore in Manhattan was having similar issues. And then it doesn't only apply to books. Some of the real landmarks in Harvard Square have begun to disappear permanently. Um, fairly recently, our neighbor around the corner from our store, Cafe Pamplona, where I have spent almost every afternoon for the last 10 years, has gone away. So we come up with a strategy for this. And if we can't condense the holiday season into those two weeks that it's been in the past, then we're trying to extend the holiday season. So we've come up with the slogan, October is the new December. We moved a lot of events, holiday oriented events that happened in November and December into October. And also because the store is limited to really make a push for web sales. One of the unfortunate things we had to do, um, for those of you who know the store know that our used books are in our basement. Um, we had to close the store basement. And the reason for that is with the high volume of web sales, we need a lot of employees focused on that. And, but the problem is they have to stay socially distant. So we can't cram them into a shipping room. We needed the basement so that they, we could process the web orders and they could all maintain a, a safe social distance. And then our trade association has launched a campaign essentially against Amazon, basically saying, don't box out bookstores. Um, some stores have carried this um, to quite an extreme. This is the um, front of um, Greenlight Bookstore in Brooklyn, New York. And I love their signs, buy books from people who want to sell books, not collage the moon. I think that has to do with Jeff Bezos. Um, and then the other sign I'm reading there says books that are books curated by real people, not a creepy algorithm. Um, and here's another uh, example. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite bookstores in the country. I've been there several times. It's the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Lawrence, it's a wonderful place to visit. <clears throat> and then another part of our strategy is to take advantage of tools which are available in the web for the first time really, that allow us to do really important things very, very quickly. So we built an entire, so we decided to move the warehouse sale, for, which I explained to you had gone viral uh, virtually. Um, and we built an entire separate website in a matter of a week for it. It's called hbswarehousesale.com. We've done, we're currently in the middle of a warehouse sale right now. I encourage you to go over and look at it. There are tremendous, uh, bargains on really, really good books. And the, cus the customers have responded to this. We've done it now twice, two warehouse sales, virtual warehouse sales. We're in the middle of our third. And in each one, we had over 2,000 orders. Um, and then we've been doing something similar using this utility called Bonfire, which allows us to offer branded like sweatshirts and t-shirts and tote bags without the inventory risks. Normally, if we offer that in the store, we have to make a commitment to buy lots and lots of that stuff. In Bonfire, we, we, we initiate a campaign. People buy whatever they want from our page and we never touch the inventory. Bonfire is just, the campaign ends and they, they create, they make the, shirt, well, the various uh, uh, products that have been purchased and then they pay us a commission on it. So here is the web page that we built. This is the landing page for our warehouse sale. And here's our page for Bonfire with some designs which some of our staff came up with for t-shirts, sweatshirts. And we've sold, we've sold many, many hundreds of these, maybe in excess of a thousand now. Here's, here's a closer up of the, of, the, of the design. This is the building that the store is in with the store's logo. And you can see all kinds of dogs and cats reading books in the window. One of the other things that we did was um, my wife and I sent a letter um, to all of our customers and we did it all over social media. It got picked up by the press, simply describing the situation in the store direct, basically as I've described it to you. Um, and the effect was overwhelming. So here's the chart of web sales um, and you can see where the letter happened. 
um, I talked about the fact that typically web sales are 10 times what they were in the in the pre pandemic. Well, this was 40 times more, more recent web sales or 400 times what our usual daily volume was. And this was um, essentially one day um, uh, sales just exploded. So looking forward, um, here are the sort of, I guess they're not really answers, they're questions. Um, can we sustain and can we sustain an increased level of sales? Can we bring about an increased level of sales, which will keep us viable, or will slow the bleeding to the extent that we can, you know, that we can survive until the pandemic ends? A big bill comes due in January when we have to pay for the books that we purchased in the holiday for the holiday season. Will there be another federal stimulus package? Um, you know, who knows? With the Democrats in charge of the White House and the Republicans in charge of the Senate, will anything happen? Um, when will we return to normal? Well, that's the question we're all asking, whether it's about books or any other part of our lives. A longer term, the, question, the serious question we have to ask, are consumer habits changing permanently? You read a lot about this now. Um, you know, are customers becoming habituated to doing all of their commerce on the internet? Um, will Harvard Square became, be, remain an attractive place to visit if many of the cool, funky businesses have closed? Will the publishers adopt this direct-to-consumer strategy? And when will we return to normal again? So a little bit on how we might be able to work together. Um, one thing is, is, it's always been a very important to our store and our brand to work with small presses. We think some of the interesting things that are happening publishing are happening at small presses. So it is part of our image, our brand, to give significant support both to emerging authors and to small presses. Um, one of the ways we did that was through our consignment program. And unfortunately, we've had to suspend our consignment program for the pan pandemic. And the reason for that is just with limited occupancy in the store, we had to eliminate and, and also the, the pressures on the staff with this increased volume of web business. The, we just, the, the consignment program, though we loved it, was very, very time consuming. And just, you have to make cuts in this kind of situation. So we decided to cut that, much as we decided to cut our used business, which was also very important to us. On the other hand, our espresso book machine um, is going great guns. So it is a way in which people, you know, self-published authors or small presses can have their book carried in our, carried in our physical store through the EBM. Um, I think another more important thing here, and this is part of the good news, in the old days, when I spoke to people at, at IPNI and other um, um, uh, small presses in general, they were always interested in two things. Can we get an event with you? And will you carry the book in the store? Well, in terms of the second matter, um, we're, it's not like the store is not important to us, but we're much, much less interested in the physical store these days simply because we can only derive so much revenue from the store given the capacity limitations. So our action is switching to the web. And the answer is we are carrying your book on your web if you are distributing your book through Ingram. So the, the, the question I've always had to deal with, you know, or can you carry my book? My answer now is we are carrying your book in the way which is most important to us. Um, on book readings, this is a little bit more complicated. As I said, we try to devote um, a, a lot of uh, effort to less well-known authors. Um, the problem that we often have in this regard when I'm approached by a sort of small press or a self-published writer um, is that the question always comes up too late. <clears throat> Given how busy our schedule is, we schedule three to four months in advance. So it often happens, um, a press comes to me and says, we have a new book that's coming out next week, can we do an event? And the answer is, we want to do the events close to pub time. And, but we're booked, by the time that question is asked, it should have been asked four months ago. So <clears throat> in order to get events with us, you really have to follow that kind of calendar and let us know about it, the book long in advance. Um, 
And, um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, we're completely open to doing it. Um, I, um, I'm happy to sort of work with you on any of these sorts of, uh, of issues. And please contact me. It's going to be increasingly hard, given the pressures on the staff, to really reach to the buyer or the um, 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 or the marketing folks. Um, but I promise to work as your conduit into our, our business if you're interested. And here's my email address. It's the best way to contact me. And um, thanks a lot. And happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's very, very informative. Have you looked into getting people to pre pre buy books? Uh, almost like a Kickstarter, but not using kicks. I mean, like have them send you fifty dollars, so and they could they could use that over time, something like that. Oh yeah, well we do that through our we have gift cards, and okay. and and that's essentially what you're talking about, David, right? Um, and that's actually been a big part of the of um, of our business recently. People are buying lots and lots of gift cards, partially to, as gifts to people, but I also I think it's one of the ways they feel like they're supporting the store. Um, <clears throat> you know, eventually the bill on a gift card comes due. That is, we have to supply a book, but right now it certainly helps our cash cash situation. So yeah, so we we're doing we're doing a fair amount of that. In fact, one of the roles that my wife and I play are we are doing gift card fulfillment right from our, well, from this room, which is a dining room. In a pandemic, we have no use for our dining room. So we're doing bulk, bulk ship outs from this room. You can see a whole bunch of books packed in, behind me. And if I go this way, you can see some bubble wrap. Um, so this is where all the action is right now. <laughs> it, uh, Jeff, is there a way to, um, can we, is there an automated way to, to upload a, a title to the uh, page Gutenberg and, and um, just, or, or do we do, go through call you or something like that? Um, there's, no, there's not an automatic way, but, um, uh, but really what you want to do is send an email to Holly. Do, um, uh, okay, or, Holly book, or really book machine at harvard.com. Okay. Yeah, and also feel free to pop, feel free and, to copy me on it. And that's like a file that we might upload to Ingram or Lightning Source would be the same file that we would. Yeah, use. it's essentially two files, and it's simply the interior of the book and the and cover, the cover and, yeah. and, and the cover. The interior is black and white, yeah. and the cover is color. Yeah, I have had really nice experience doing that with you guys, and and especially getting like I got ten books for a book show that I, I couldn't get them quickly enough, and there were, there were more per copy, but they were, it was really convenient. And, and well, I'm going to hear you say that we, yeah, we, we try, I mean, <clears throat> one of the downsides of the machine is that it really does produce one book at a time. Yeah. So there aren't real economies yeah. of scale. Um, but in a couple days, two, three days or something, I think. But we can do very, very quick turnaround. Sometimes, depending on how busy we are that afternoon. Yeah, I've got them the same day. I mean, you, it's really easy. You just send them two files, as you said, Jeff. Yeah. You send them the cover, you send them the PDF, just like Ingram, just upload mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah, and, and your and staff is so nice. You you have the best staff. Well, thank um, you, Charlie. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question, Jeff? This is Pam. I yeah. was one of the people who came uh, when we had the tour at your yeah. place. Yeah. No. I remember that well. Yeah. Oh, wow. When you still, when you uh, first launched your <laughs> your page Gutenberg, <laughs> I was and, so uh, much. Pam, I was so much younger then. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we well, we were. So I, I, thirty years of publishing now for me. I have a question about you talked about social media, and all the 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 web so forth. Have you? How many people? In, in your staff, obviously you're you're having to have some some techies there, but how many people are involved in the social media aspect now of your business as as opposed to what it was before? I mean, it sounds like you've had to increase your communication. I get your newsletter all the time, and I'm 
I guess I've been too busy trying to get my last book out to go to your virtual events, but I live up in Amesbury and to come into Harvard Square at night for one of your, your <laughs> book events is really stretching. So um, I'm gonna look forward to perhaps to going to more of your, to, to your virtual, virtual events, but uh, the social media question, I wondered yeah. if you've had to increase your staff or just reassign them. We've um, over the years as the event program, as, as you know, as I mentioned before that we, before the pandemic hit, we were doing 400 author events a year, um, four to four to 500 actually. And so we be, as those, and partially it's a result of my inability to say no, but that's, that's only, that's the silly reason. The real reason there's a lot of good stuff out there and there was an audience for all of this stuff and and we feel that one of the services we provided the community is to give us you know is to is, is are, are these you know virtual events where we're doing three a day um so over the course of the years we've expanded our so the bulk of the work is done by our core marketing staff and this includes running the events social media and, and social media, I guess it's, um, and um, we have, um, um, in terms of full time staff, we have five people working in the marketing group, and so that's you know tweeting and uh, and the newsletter and Facebook and Instagram and all of that and and, and all of that. So there are five people in the group, but they're supplemented by what we call the squad. And these are people typically with day jobs um, who work, who support our events. In the, in, the, um, in the, prior to the pandemic, what that often meant was if we had an event at the Back Bay Event Center with 1,100 people, you can't just staff it with five marketing people. You need actually sometimes 15 or 20 staff to check the people in and to show them to their seats and to take care of the author. So in addition to the core marketing staff of four or five, we have about four or five others right now who actually run virtual events. So it consists right now of four or five full-timers and four or five part-timers who, who simply run events. Uh, did, that, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Could yeah. you could you take down your sharing screen and then we can- Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, thanks, thanks. I made a note to do that like an hour ago and I- Okay, forgot. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Well, good, thank you. Well, yeah, and you get even more sympathy and, and uh, mm -hmm. feeling a responsibility mm -hmm. for Jabberwocky next door and new mm -hmm. report and as well as you and all the other independents trying to survive. Yeah, How's and Jabberwocky oh, doing? Okay, who's was that? Sorry, Pam, I was Charlotte, wondering if Charlotte asked if, if she could show us what that walk looks like. What walk? <laughs> Pam? <laughs> Do you have an uh, sort of an anti Amazon strategy? Uh, I mean, I've seen those boxes um, online and read about Shakespeare and Company, but I'm just curious as to, is there any coexistence with them that, that you have, or is it pretty much? No, we're... Not? How does... Just yeah. curious. You, you, you mean, is there any collaboration at all? Yeah. We... No, no there isn't. We, we tried at one point. Um, but um, you know they're pretty territorial. Um, um, you know some worse adjectives come to mind. Um, just in terms of the way they run their business, it's you know no holds barred, take no prisoners um, sort of um, sort of approach to the business world. You know I've read quotes from. Um, publishers who went in to talk to them and they felt like they had to run out and take a shower afterwards. Um, you know, I mean, they're a great company. What they've done is truly amazing. Um, and, um, 
you know, the, the thing which is, you know, I'm complaining about that we're relying on the USPS. More and more, I see Amazon jets, Amazon trucks on the highway. So they've built their own, in, their own transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, they, they will colonize the moon someday. Their, uh, their, model, their model is really built around uh, controlling that uh, environment. So it's not friendly to, right. uh, to playing nice like that because they, they're, they're building control of that environment. Yeah, and what they want to do is they, you know, all of these companies, the same is true of Apple and Google also, yeah. they want to they want to trap the customer in their own walled garden so that yeah. every purchase of everything they make, you know, my theory is they focused on books because people who buy books tend to be better educated, maybe have higher incomes. And so, you know, if they trap them in their prime universe, then you know, the, the, they lead with books, but then they sell you, you know, um, TVs. Anything. And anything. But, but they, they found out early on, and, and not to make this a bashing, bashing session, but they knew about big data way before any of us knew about big data. Mm -hmm. And the thing about books that are cheap to publish in an e-format that tells you about e-data is trends about people. What topics are they looking at? What things are they interested in? And then, hello, I know who you are. I can market <laughs> all things to you. You want a plastic screw. How did you know that? Yeah. You're right, <laughs> big, neat. Well, I, you know, I agree with you completely, but I will say this, that a lot of their recommendations to me are completely incoherent, right? So for example, if I have a friend who wants, who's a boater and I buy him some boat things, they're recommending boat stuff to me, but, but I mean, you're, you're right. They, uh, but they, they know enough to know you might share that with that guy, even though it's not you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a boat thing, uh, you know, but statistically, I, I, right. That pans out for them. I just back to David's question though. I, I, I will say one thing. Um, we worked with Harvard business school for a little bit to, to look at what messaging works and, um, um, and so we did this experiment where when people entered the store, we gave them randomly one of several messages from a little bit of the story of the store, a little bit about the story of the store and the financial condition we're in, and a very anti-Amazon message that if you do this, you're putting small businesses out of, if you buy from them, you're destroying neighborhoods, you're putting small businesses out of business. And then we um, after so that they, they received these messages when they went into the store, when they left the store, we looked at their receipts and made a recorded how much they purchased, and it would, the results were very very interesting. The worst results were from the you would think maybe that the people who got the explicitly anti Amazon message would buy more from us having heard that message just when they entered the store. The fact of the matter is the result was the opposite. Um, um, and um, our interpretation of that is people don't like to be told what to do. And when you enter a business where you're excited about buying stuff, you don't want to be depressed by a very negative message. Well, I think there's, I, I'm sure this could be discussed quite a bit, but I think the storytelling and the community aspect, you talked about, you know, the bookstores being part of the community, and we actually talked about that on another one of the sessions. Um, but, you know, with Amazon, their motto is to try to, to deliver the best customer experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if people want that, you've got to off, and, and they're, they have their own delivery systems and they have really good prices and all that. Somehow you've got to offset that with something else. And the other problem, I mean, I know people who talk about really despising Amazon, then they go to Whole Foods, you know? Right. And I literally, <laughs> I mean, I literally would go to these meetings and people would, all these retailers would, would literally, they would bitch about Amazon left and right. And then they would go order something, you oh, know, yeah. that was from, that was somehow connected with Amazon. And it's sort of like, you can't have it both ways. Um, I mean, you sort of can, but you also can't. Yeah, but I no, I, I agree with you, David. The, the, my example of that is the person who comes to me and says, God, I hate Amazon, I hate Jeff Bezos, but I love that guy at Zappos. 
and I love buying shoes from Zappos. You know? <laughs> well, that's where they're so big, you don't even necessarily know what all the divisions are. Right. <laughs> so Jeffrey, I'm going to be in touch with you because I have, uh, my book is supposed to come out about four months down the line. So my oh. time, my time. <laughs> Wonderful. And I had, uh, I've been so focused on uh, public speaking and storytelling and was really counting on back of the room sales and all of that. And so now it's like, it's going to be a whole different ball game trying to yeah, I mean, it, it is. And like, like I said, one of the great disappointments is just that I, it is, is the lack of sales at virtual events. Now, by the way, from the author's perspective, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It may be that the books are being bought, but because it's virtual, so they've got one screen open with the event and another screen open with Amazon and they're yeah. purchasing, <laughs> they're purchasing the books on Amazon. Yeah. But you know, I just want to come back to Dave, David's question. I think you know our strategy against them is to do things that they can't do. Mm -hmm. So to the extent we can get signed book plates and signed books, that's one of you know that's one approach. They don't do the author events. Um, you know, is 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 another approach. So a lot of the stuff we're doing is really to focus on things that they can't do. But it is a tough market. If somebody knows specifically the book that they want, it's very easy for them just to go and get it from Amazon. Um, um, also, I think what's changed is that um, people who might have wanted to go into a local store believe in shopping local, and the store was closed yeah. for a period of time. They couldn't. So they became an Amazon buyer. As right. a publisher, um, my sales, I mean, they didn't order from me for six to eight weeks, at least April and May. Um, they were delivering soap. They were delivering, you know, the, every, every Monday night, I'd get this, this note saying, sorry, we're not ordering books because we are busy uh, shipping necessity, essential items. Mm -hmm. and toilet paper, paper towels, you know. I forgot to mention that. That's absolutely right. And that was really a magic moment for us when they were no, when for that <laughs> period they weren't doing. And that's, that's the period at the beginning when we started fulfilling our own web orders that web sales exploded. Um, mm -hmm. So there were two phases of that. One is during that period, people bought from us. The other one, later on is when Linda and I wrote that letter to the community, they said, okay, we get it, you know? Um, and so we're gonna buy thousands and thousands. It was actually, I think in the space of three days, we sold more than 10,000 books. Um, and so it was, you know, so that was great. Um, the, um, uh, the small problem in that is, um, um, we're not Amazon. It takes us a little bit of time to fulfill orders for 10,000 books. But so far, people have been patient with us. Um, but we, the other thing that we've done is we've really staffed up. We are now, you know, even this, though the stores are heart and joy, we have really almost paradoxically in this, we're in this terrible economic situation. Over the last few weeks, we've been adding staff like crazy. Huh. Good. Jeffrey, can I ask a quick question about yeah. bookshop.org that you mentioned earlier? Um, your reason for pulling back from them, was that uh, a margin issue that when you're able to fill your own books, it's just better yeah. for you to supply them yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. There's, um, we're going into a, uh, we'll just start another lockdown here in the UK and a lot of our independent sellers are pinning their hopes on uh, the UK version of Bookshop, which has just launched. Um, but I guess it's always a second best for you guys, is it? Yeah, it's it's a second best because it's, uh, there, are, there are a number of reasons for that. It's sort of limited. We were selling, I mean, you can order any book from them. Um, 
they do a good they do a good service. Essentially, what they are is they're partnered with Ingram here at right. least, and so. Uh, as far as I know, all fulfillment from Bookshop goes through Ingram. So they have a large inventory. What we were doing during that period is we wanted some of our own branding. Um, and so our employees who had almost nothing to do because the shop was closed, we weren't fulfilling web orders, they were generating lists. So our Bookshop site was populated with lists, the sort of lists that you would find at Harvard Bookstore rather than an agent, you know, it's branded as, as by our store. And that was a major activity um, um, for us. But there's also, you know, their motivation is good. They were looking to serve the small booksellers of the world. But once you launch a service like that and they accumulate a list of names and they have a bunch of employees, then you know whether or not their intentions were great, and we were love at the very in, at, from the very beginning. They're right. competitors. Yeah, you know, absolutely. they've got they they are now marketing to our customers. Yeah, and um, and you know you enter bookshop, and even though we had our own lists, it's generic. The margins are less. It's not like selling, um, you know, selling from our own website. Right. It's sort of like walking around in somebody else's shoes. It's never really comfortable. <laughs> right. Great. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Jeffrey, can I just, um, I just want to say this has been a super great chat. Um, and the whole day, I think, has been full of great chats. So before I just, I know we're at six o'clock before I wrap up, I'm just going to say uh, for anybody who does want to keep chatting, I'm going to leave this session open for a bit, so feel free to. But in the event anybody was planning on the six o'clock cut time, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining and uh, and especially to all the speakers and, and Jeffrey. This has been a great chat and all the other great chats. And uh, and if you are leaving us, um, hopefully we see you tomorrow uh, at tomorrow's session. In the meantime, like I said, I'm going to leave this open for conversation for a bit, so feel free. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you. Election trauma. Jeffrey, I was just wondering about uh, widespread irregularities or fraud, but the attack by the president on the democratic process continues. They're finding. Um, I had a question about uh, IndieBound. Is that something that you guys get any orders from? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that um, a good thing to do? I mean, I'd rather refer people to them than to. Amazon, but yeah, well, IndieBound is from the the um, is our trade association. Yeah. So we use um, our website. Use what the trade association gives us is um, 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 is the back end of. So they provide the infrastructure for our own website. Mm -hmm. So when you when you purchase a book from us, the order is place through indie commerce yeah they provide that infrastructure have you, have you talked to robin cutler at all from ingram i have not uh, what you're doing and all that uh, she just left november 2nd oh, did she oh really well, um i'm part of the bay area oh. independent publishers group that was my group when i lived in marin and they're doing virtual events. Their meetings may have 60, 80 people on a Zoom meeting. So I can take advantage. And, and she, she did a, a similar um, talk that she did with Ibni last year. And she said she was retiring. And wow. her last day was somewhere around November 2nd. I forgot who it is that's coming in, but. Um, and which, uh, which part of Ingram did she, did she represent? Ingram Spark. She's okay. the one that created the whole idea of Ingram Spark. Yeah, I, I may have spoken with her. I think she may have spoken at the conference, yeah, la the last, last conference year. last year. Yes, she, she did. Also, I think yeah. she also used to work for Create Space and or started Create that, Space. That was her idea too. Yeah, so she's she, she she's sort of like the monarch of self-publishing then. Mm -hmm. um, as an independent publisher, I, I had a book that was coming out somewhere around May or June, and I was redoing my website and trying to get 
this book out. It's an anthology about Waldorf education. And I had 65 authors. And I must say the whole impact with the post office has, has really impacted. I had purposely not put my book yet on Amazon. I wanted the sales coming from my, to my website. <laughs> But I have found my dining room would become my shipping room like yours. And I was ordering stamps. But even my postmistress um, says it's, it's hard for her to get the things she's ordering. I ordered stamps online and supplies, those padded um, priority mail padded envelopes where I can put two books in. I ordered them in September a pack at 25 and they still haven't come in yet. And who'd you order them from? Um, from the U.S. Postal Service online. Oh. And finally, I gave the list of, of the kind of stamps that I wanted um, to the postmistress and she got them. And because I won't go to my box because I'm in a high risk group, I haven't gone into the post office since March 13th. They are, thankfully, I live in a small town they're very happy to come to the back door <laughs> with all my packages, take them in, and I write out a check. And they're still doing that for me. So, um, well, I have to say this since we're doing shipping out from my dining room here about uh, six to 800 books a week. Um, you uh, be tired of it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we've, what we found is that you can get. Um, mail bubble mailers, which is what we use. Yeah. Um, we hate to use them because their their politics. This is my me speaking with my politics are not really great, but they provide great customer service. So you can get hundreds of bubble mailers essentially overnight from Uline. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I've got their their things. These happen to be the flat rate once for the US Postal, so I don't have to pay so much. But well, we, we, we ship them media mail if, if we yeah. and, and um, I have lost six packages media mail uh -huh. um, in 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 the last two months. Um, and so I ended up on my website encouraging people to pay the extra for priority. Because yeah. um, I, I wondered if you had any problems with media mail not getting to the customers. I've never I hear had lots. I hear lots of stories from various parts of the country. Mm -hmm. We we have not seen it locally here yet. No. Well, good. Glad to hear that. Thank you for letting me rant. <laughs> Why anyone would have mailed in their ballot after all that nonsense about the postmaster? Yeah. I can't. I, I took it in person <laughs> to my clerk. The reason is because it keeps the suspense up. I guess I can I could use a little less suspense in there. Yeah, I'm going to sign off because Brooks and Shields will be coming on PBS NewsHour pretty soon, and I want to get them. Great to see you, Bye. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, and nice to see everybody. Maybe we'll okay. see you tomorrow. Thanks so much. It's always great to talk to you guys. And <laughs> David, thanks for inviting me. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, we'll support you in social media and stuff whenever we can so all right thanks so much take care appreciate it